Hello, thank you for joining us today. We're going to wait just a couple of minutes until everyone is on board. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. We are waiting just a few more seconds until everyone has had a chance to log in and then we'll get started. Alrighty, while we're waiting for everyone else to join us, I'm going to go over some housekeeping. My name is Leah Freeberg with Fluke Excelix, and uh, today is a best practices webinar. You probably know Fluke is a test tool provider, and you may also know that we produce some of the industry's favorite reliability tools, infrared cameras, vibration meters, but you may not actually know that some of our measurements that our tools collect now flow automatically into a variety of EAM systems of record. And that data transfer happens via a framework that we call Fluke Excelix. Our goal is to better connect as much asset management data as we can into existing asset management systems. And it all turns around best practices in condition-based maintenance. So that's why this series of webinars explores reliability maintenance strategies. And that's why we feature speakers from a variety of expert backgrounds. Before the presentation gets rolling, I have a few housekeeping items for you. Today's session is being recorded, so your phone lines are muted to minimize background noise. We'll save time after the presentation for your questions, though. So if you have questions during the presentation, you're very welcome to use the questions feature on GoToWebinar to submit questions as we go. So take a minute now, find the questions tool in your dashboard. At the end of the talk, I'll share as many of your questions as I can for our presenters to answer. And if we have unanswered questions yet, when we have to wrap, then we'll follow up with written answers. If you'd like to receive the slides from today's presentation, let us know. There'll be a survey that appears at the end of the session, so hang on till the very end. And then as webinar closes, you'll see a survey pop up. Enter the survey and you'll get, a, you'll get sent a copy of the slides. You'll also be able to watch a recording of this webinar on excelx.com within a day or two. So that's it for housekeeping and now for the main event. Today, we are very pleased to have two presenters from Fluke Reliability with us, John Burnett and Dries Van Loon. They'll be presenting on proactive maintenance strategies to extend the life of your assets. John, if you'll advance to the first slide, I want to introduce you a bit. Okay. Let me get the controls to work, sorry. There we go. There we go. So as a mechanical application and product specialist at Flute Corporation, John works with customers from all industries success and helps them successfully implement their reliability programs. He has more than 30 years of experience in the maintenance and operation of commercial mach machinery and is a nuclear power plant electrician in the U.S. Navy, where all of our best folks come from. He holds a Category 2 Vibration Analyst Certification and is a Certified Maintenance Reliability Professional CMRP. Welcome, John, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Leah. I'm very happy to be with everyone today and for this opportunity to share some ideas. I love every chance I get to, to attend one of your webinars. John, you do a great job. Thank you. Thanks. I'd also like to introduce Dries Van Loon. John, I feel forward to Dries' slide. I'm having a little bit of technical. There we go. Yeah, it's flickering a bit on us. Dries is a sales and product manager, online condition monitoring for Fluke Corporation with 10 years of experience in predictive maintenance. He joined Proof Technic, which was acquired by Fluke last year, when he was still in Belgium as an application engineer. And then he moved to the company's US office in 2014 to set up a condition monitoring department. His group served all of the US on condition monitoring activities such as proactive maintenance, remote temporary monitoring, troubleshooting, and torque measurements. He became a certified ISO CAT4 analyst in 2017. So welcome, Dries. 
Uh, hey, good morning. Thank you uh, for joining everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, to be here with you today. Excellent. Now, I am so excited. This is the first webinar that I've done where we've gotten to have both Proof Technic and Fluke folks, and it is such a power combination. It's fantastic. Um, and in particular, before we get started, I have actually a question for the two of you, because you've both been in the field for so long, um, and it has felt to me, at least in the last couple of years, is that reliability is really experiencing a bit of a heyday, where there's a lot more respect, right? A lot more, a lot more facilities are aware of the benefits and value, it appears, of reliability maintenance practices. Do you, do you agree? Do you see the same thing out there? Oh, absolutely, I do. I I think that where it used to be reliability was just a buzzword and they talked about it, um, you know, that a CEO and a few people would talk about it. Now it's becoming, um, you know, not just um, a cost that, that maintenance has to, to do. Everybody has seen it as uh, a way to improve the efficiency in the plant. And uh, so, it's uh, it's it's becoming uh, talked about in all boardrooms now, and and uh, everybody is realizing that reliability is very important. Uh, where That's for fantastic. the past thirty years it is hasn't been. So yeah. Yeah, Dries, what do you think? No, I think absolutely. In the past, I think we would see the the maintenance, or maybe they would even call them the repair team, somewhere yeah. in the back in a shack, and they would be just called whenever <laughs> there was an issue. And I think these days, uh, the the maintenance and reliability engineers and managers uh, in the world, they they get involved um, around the table from the beginning on, right? From yeah. the design process and, and on forward. So I think that's a really good um, progress we're seeing, but it's still a lot of places, there's still a long way to go, so. Yep. Well, I think that's a perfect segue. Why don't I hand the mic over to you guys and you can take it from here. Okay, great. Thanks. So uh, thank you very much, Leah. So um, we'll uh, hopefully we'll figure out why the computer is uh, flickering on us, but uh, maybe it'll figure itself out a little bit. So let's start a little bit at the beginning here. We're going to talk about today's maintenance landscape and we're going to start a little bit about looking at some of the challenges and then we're going to wrap it up with some solutions. We'll turn it over to Dries later on and uh, he'll talk about some solutions. So let's uh, let's get moving here. So um, when we look at today's maintenance landscape, you know, maintenance teams are all having to do more with less and uh, all with the cost of doing business increasing every day. And uh, as we talk to uh, our customers uh, for the past few years, we realize that this is coming from uh, three main causes, you know. One is uh, a retiring workforce. The second is more complex machines and systems. And third, less funding, higher goals. And so it seems like things that used to be uh, impossible are just getting worse and worse and worse and you'll see a study here that uh, shows some numbers and I think everybody's to agree that uh, things are just getting tougher and we just can't ignore um, and and uh, just keep letting it get worse so so what are maintenance teams supposed to do you know we we see this impossible situation and as and, and there's nothing new here you know a lot of organizations, you know, we've all heard over the years about, you know, reactive maintenance and preventive maintenance, and and we've all, uh, you know, heard about predictive maintenance and condition-based maintenance, and we all know about the the downside to reactive and the upside of of predictive, and um, everybody on this journey of of trying to move more towards the proactive side. But what we're finding is a lot of people need some help on this and, uh, you know, uh, some guidance and, and maybe a little bit of, uh, you know, what, you know, what, what have we learned? And, and so that's what we're going to talk about today is how can uh, some successful customers in the past give us some ideas on, on where to go. So let's start off a little bit about looking at the potential failure curve. And I, I know that we uh, kind of put that in our abstract and many of you have probably already seen this curve. And if you if you look at it, uh, you know, you'll see that at the end of the curve way over here on the right, you can see that's where failure happens in catastrophe. And we all want to we all want to prevent that from happening in the past. We were looking things like uh, time directed task, you know, preventive type task, but that that sometimes is a little too little, a little too late. And then we talk about wanting to move into the predictive side. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today about, 
you know, infrared imaging, motor testing, uh, vibration analysis, um, fluid analysis, ultrasound testing, and some of these things in the more predictive, because what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to know when a machine is going to fail before it gets to the point where the cost of repair and the, and the wasted energy starts taking over. But one thing that we also want to think about is, you know, it isn't just about catching it just before it fails. It used to be that's, that was the name of the game. You know, we want to get as much life out of a machine, but what we found out is that that's a dangerous way to run a, a plant because the cost to repair gets higher and where we have a lot of wasted energy. And when you look at this curve, there's a couple things that many of us don't even have a chance to look at, and that's way over on the left. You know, don't forget about the inherent reliability. And I'm not going to get too deep into this because many of us are way over here on the far right. But think about the inherent reliability as the as the design and the precision. It's kind of the upfront, you know, uh, the overall robustness of a system, and it's the upper limit of your reliability. Um, and then if you look over on over on the right, the in, the inherent availability, which is kind of where we're at now, that's our steady state availability, and that's considering only what corrective maintenance can do. So what does this really mean? Well, focus on making the difference between these two parts in that the design and installation, the, the proactive part way over on the left is important because any asset that's properly designed and installed, that means that when we go over to the right, then its capacity is going to be 100%. But if the design and precision isn't good, then we're never going to get 100% over on the right. So, so what does that mean? That means that we can never maintain um, and 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 fix a problem with the design and installation. So. We're not. We're just mentioning this now. For now, we just want to work about at the right side of the of the graph. But but keep in mind, there's a lot more to it than that. Okay. And then one thing before we get rolling and running into this is there's more to um, to reliability than just the tools and the technology. So here you can see that the data, which is kind of the central part. Um, is, um, you know, there's really three parts that talk, that work with that data. The technologies, the tools, which we all uh, hear about and talk about, but we can't forget about the process and the people because if we don't work on the people and the process, then the technology and the tools aren't going to work. It's all interrelated. Okay. And now we're ready to go to a poll question. So Leah, can you help us through this first poll question? I'd be happy to. Now, folks, we ask these poll questions for a couple of reasons. Um, one, uh, we really do want to know where you're at on your journey. Um, and it also it helps our presenters sort of customize uh, what they're saying to where the answers you give us. So take a minute now, where are you at on your reliability journey? Are you really conducting a fair amount of predictive maintenance on your critical assets? Are you doing a mix of planned maintenance and some predictive, either in-house or, or outsourced? Are you doing a mix of planned and reactive? So reactive with a, a fair number of PMs in there maybe. Or are you at mostly reactive maintenance? And again, all plants are different, different types of criticality. so. So no judgment, think about what your ideal is and where you're at now. I'm gonna give it just another couple of seconds and get about 65 or 70% of us voted. And then we'll share the results with you on screen. So where are you at right now in your reliability journey? And this will help John and Dries kind of tailor the presentation to you a little bit. All right, we're at 65% voted. So I'm going to share the results with everyone now. So let's take a look at this. We've only got 15% of folks doing mostly reactive. You've got 56%, so about half, doing a mix of planned and reactive maintenance. About a quarter doing mostly planned with some predictive. 
and 8% doing predictive maintenance on critical assets. John and Dries, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, that, that sounds about right. Dries, Dries what do you, you think? Yeah, it feels like a pretty good representation of what we see day to day in the field um, where we're still mostly mixed of plant and reactive and, and we're slowly trending upwards towards more of that uh, Mm -hmm. using that predictive data and then trying to to use that more effectively i think and that's one part of the of this webinar obviously right yep excellent right. okay i will hide this and then that'll turn it back over to you all okay thanks well then let's let's get rolling so what we're going to talk about next is over the years talking to our customers um, you know, we, we said, you know, what kind of questions are they asking? And as we're talking to new customers, we're finding out that everybody's asking the same questions, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, there's really three challenges that are confronting, uh, you know, today's maintenance leaders. Um, they, everybody wants to grow reliability, but how can we possibly do it when we're already 100% busy? Um, the next is, you know, how do we monitor all of our critical assets when we have limited resources, which kind of rolls into the first question. And then how do we balance our time and resources between critical assets and all the assets we maintain? So um, as we talk with hundreds of maintenance leaders and technicians, um, no matter what the industry or the country or the team size, we're hearing the same thing about this constant battle of keeping plants up and running with, uh, with the restraints. And sometimes you end up spending too much time, um, you know, on uh, low value assets because you're spending all your time on the squeaky wheel. So let's let's take a little bit deeper look into this um, criticality uh, aspect. And um, you know, this this is kind of the first step of looking into um, reliability. So um, if you do a criticality analysis, which is usually the first part of a, of a reliability program, you often get a long list and everything looks critical. And it's like, how can I possibly maintain that? And traditionally, people think of this as, as there's four different ways that uh, they approach this, this, this criticality problem. Oops, sorry about that. It looks like my, uh, there we go. Okay, maybe that'll stop flickering now. Sorry about that. One is, you know, binary. So if it's not critical, I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, another is you force rank your criticality. So, you know, if you have 20, John, then you... Uh, I'm going to interrupt yes. you for a second because yep. it looks as though our poll is is persistent on screen. And so I'm going to change our presenters here. And I apologize to everyone for interrupting the presentation this way. But... Um, that will hopefully force it back out of poll mode. Yeah, maybe maybe part of that is what's given us the uh, the flicker. The flicker. I don't know. Okay. All right. Oh, all right. So all right. Thanks. thanks, everyone. All right. Let me let me. So I'll finish up here. So we could force rank it. Um, you know, you could also um, be a little bit creative in your scheduling. Um, you know, if I can schedule it out far enough, I'll eventually get to everything. And the last one is, you know, you just give up. You know, if I don't have enough staff and enough budget, um, I'm just not going to be able to get everything. So all of these approaches, and I've been in the maintenance world for many, many, many years. And I, I was on an aircraft carrier as a maintenance supervisor uh, in an engine room. And uh, we had the same things back then 20 years ago. All of these approaches are unsustainable and they miss the deep root cause and that is we have more assets than we have capacity, than we have resources. So how are we going to do this? Well, let's see if we can ask around and maybe we can find some some ideas on how other, um, you know, uh, you know, so let's, oh, uh, my my screen was 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 having an issue here. So so what do we do? You know, in the ideal world, everybody knows that we want to have reliability you know predictability safer workplaces increased maintenance intervals reliability better peace of mind we all want that but then in the real world we run into issues there's challenges and obstacles you know with with reactive maintenance you know we uh, it's very stressful and there's um, a lot of failures and there's a lot of downtime and uh, I'm not sure why we're losing uh, this presenter mode, I apologize I for that. Know, so carry on. 
Okay, so I'll just keep moving along. Um, with PMs, you know, PMs are 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 great, but um, you know, studies have shown that on rotating machinery, that failures are still random, 85%. So PMs isn't 100% successful by any means. And then, you know, predictive maintenance. Um, you know, we all have limited budget and time. So the problem is, do we have to choose one of these? And a lot of people feel like they they have a bad choice to make. And, and how can you possibly uh, pick one of these bad choices? And so let's look at some solutions that some of our customers have been successful with. And let's, uh, let's see if we can find a way to kind of uh, work our way through this. So some of our successful customers that we've worked with have, have found a way to do this when they're already 100% busy is by following three pillars. The first pillar is when you wanna start up a reliability program, the number one problem is you try to start too big. And when you start too big, then what happens is you're still setting up the program when people, when managers are asking for success and you can't show it. So the solution to this is to start small and grow. If you start small and grow on a pilot program, you get some success, you show it, you grow it, you get more funding. The second pillar that we want to talk about that successful customers have, have shown us has worked out well for them is the technology selection. Don't try to do everything with one tool, okay? Match the right tool to your failure mode. So you're going to want to do a do a failure mode analysis and try to figure out where are your failures? What, what technology should you start with? Don't just try to use one. And then finally, the number one problem of a program that fails is data overload. You're now collecting all this data and if it doesn't give you an answer, then it's wasted data. It's, it's just data overload. So that's why, um, you know, we can help you go through and learn how to use each of these types of tools or pillars. One is a criticality survey, which we talked about. A second is an expected failure mode analysis. You can find out what tools you should be starting with. And then finally, bringing all the data to the right people and the right tools and, and make, make the right decisions. So those are some things that we found start small, use the right tools, and then get good answers. So let's kind of do a little bit of a look back now. You know, how do other people that are fo faced with this, this dilemma, how do they face it? Well, let's look at the, at the healthcare industry. Because in the healthcare industry, you've got millions of patients and not enough specialists. Every every patient is equally important, so we can't just say I'm only going to take care of the most critical people because everybody is critical. So that's unacceptable. We can't throw in vast resources because we just don't have enough people. So the healthcare industry, what they do is they use a tiered approach where nurses and wellness screening are going to try to screen out whether you need to see a doctor or not, and then general practice doctor they're going to know the five or six most common problems and be able to see if they can take care of that. So the idea here is try to take care of a problem at the lowest level before you have to go to an expert, before you have to go to a specialist. Because if we do that, then it's a much better way of, of screening out and it levels the workload and it means that we can cover millions of patients with only a few specialists. So why don't we do that with the maintenance world? And so in the maintenance world, we have the same problem. We have too many critical machines, not enough resources. So instead of spending time analyzing healthy machines, we don't wanna deploy our experts on simple faults or do unnecessary work orders. So sometimes we need tools that to see what is really going on with the asset but sometimes we just need to screen the machines. So with our healthcare analogy, condition-based screening would help reduce the workload and align the task to appropriate resources. 
So this approach has a potential to unlock the team capacity and extend the best reliability practices across the entire plant. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So we talked about this earlier, you know, how do we bridge this skills gap? One of the most, one of the things that we're seeing, and this is just becoming more and more evident, is that we just don't have the experts that we had five, 10, 15 years ago. They're retiring, they're leaving. And, and uh, so we've got to find a way to do more with less and with, 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 with the skills gap. And so the way to do that, you know, first we want to classify our machines into three major categories. Well, again, this is looking a little bit like that tiered approach again, isn't it? So when we do this, we can see that only the top 10% or so are the are the machines that they're they're very, very critical. They're there are star athletes that really require a specialist, but 60, 90% of our machines are pretty basic machines. So why don't we look at that the same kind of thing way we do it in the healthcare is let's break this up into some simple classifications to be able to look at all of our machines. So the first thing we can do is let's screen our machines. So 90% of the machines in a plant are simple rotating motors, pumps, fans, compressors, blowers. They're not that you know, difficult. So why don't we screen out with some simple tools? And just like a nurse is gonna screen out with a blood pressure, pulse, and temperature, let's quickly find out in a matter of seconds whether the machine is good or bad. And traditionally, 80% of machines are healthy. That means that only 20% we really need to take a look at, and that's when you call in the doctor, right? So we screen with a nurse, and then we call in the doctor, and if you look at it, there really are just a few faults that happen with most rotating machinery all the time. And if we can knock out that 90%, just like a doctor does, then that means that only about 10% are going to a specialist. So over on the right, you can see that there are three different types of tools. There's the screening tool at the bottom, like the nurse. There's the diagnostic tool, like the doctor. And then there's the expert tool or the specialist tool um, for, for portable tools. And we have the same type of tools in our wireless permanent or wired uh, permanent systems where we have screening tools, diagnosing tools, and um, other tools. Okay, so let's do one last real quick look at uh, a couple of things here and then we'll then we'll uh, we'll, uh, we'll get rolling so i want to look at this pdf curve one last time the potential failure curve because um one thing we want to look at is and we've talked about this you know the energy waste the cost to repair the you know trying to catch machines before they fail and using this tiered approach but let's look at one more thing so we need to have a connected ecosystem designed to detect the anomalies across the major failure modes, you know, all, you know, oil, vibration, ultrasound, thermal. Um, and that's a contrast to a lot of the CBM programs that are out there right now are only looking at one single failure mode, only one technology. So what we wanna be able to do is to support condition screening both by handheld tools used on maintenance routes and by sensors that are on our assets. So this means we'll have tools that entry-level technicians use to capture basic data and then tools for the more experienced experts. All of this data from the tools and the sensors must be stored in the same database and then trended and watched over time and analyzed by advanced software to give us a better picture of the asset health and early warnings of potential failures. So we will wanna be able to share this data with CMMS systems and enterprise systems and asset management systems so that we can then generate work orders and uh, get the appropriate team members working on it. So beyond the tools and the software, the ecosystem needs access to experts and trainers to provide, to be able to boost this up. So this ecosystem of connected tools uh, from the simple to the advanced with multiple technologies 
uh, eliminates the need for the team to have to have different solutions from different sources, bridges the gaps, and implements approaches in a tiered approach uh, to finally give us a successful program. So as we look into this connected reliability, we're going to talk about the data, the systems, and the teams. So we didn't create this overnight. We spent years of development behind the scenes and, um, you know, integrating these programs together. And it spans the depth of condition monitoring for the simple to complex um, and all failure modes, all SCADA PLC systems. Um, we've invested in leading air, sorry, leading edge software and wrapped this up in a way to, to, uh, to transfer this knowledge. Um, and we're not done. I mean, this is something that's going to continue going, and this is what we're going to be talking about uh, as we start rolling into the next section when we talk about our Excelix architecture of this new Flute Connect enabled tools uh, allow you to take data from different sources and share this data with different places. Okay, so now we're ready to go into our second poll question. So, Leah, can you help us through this? I can, and hopefully our system will not uh, take over this time, but if it does, we'll, we'll apply that other trick again. So, our second poll today is which of the following predictive maintenance technologies are you currently using? Vibration monitoring and analysis, ultrasound, infrared, oil analysis, electrical testing. You can choose as many as you are using, and this again will give us a, a, a feel for what you have uh, already enacted and what you might be thinking about. Again, it depends on what kind of plant you're running, what kind of machines you have, what kind of indicators you're looking for. We have about half the folks in who voted. Let's give it five more seconds. Let vibration, ultrasound, infrared, oil analysis, electrical testing. Click as many as it apply. And it's true, we might have had a none in there. Um, that would have been a good idea. Okay, I'm going to close it and share it. Okay, we have a lot going on. That's good to see. So um, a fairly even spread between vibration and infrared oil analysis and electrical testing with some ultrasound in there too. What do you think, guys? Um, seems that that's like that our audience is a very good mix here of um, of, yeah. of users in different uh, applications. Um, so it's good to see that it's not just uh, focused on one uh, one right. technology because it will really be a combination of of all technologies that will give you the the right data to to draw your conclusions. So I think uh, typically a mixed approach here is the is the best way to uh, to do it. Agreed. That's that's exactly right. And and so. You know, if kind of what we've been talking about before and what we're going to be talking about next is we have um, different failure modes, we have different types of machines, different assets, and quite often that needs a mix of different types of trending technologies mm -hmm. to find out the condition of the machine. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to talk about next is how do we take all that information and get that all together so that we can use that information. Okay, we'll take it away. Leah, do you have anything else? Nope. Okay. So back All right. To you. Well. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about next: is what is fluke reliability, and and um, you know how is fluke reliability here to uh, to kind of help you as you bring all of this data together, and how do you build a successful reliability program? And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about helping customers on their journey from reactive and preventive um, into predictive and proactive. Um, you know, it's one of these things where, uh, you know, a lot of people have tried it, some have failed, uh, and uh, now more and more people are saying um, where it used to be kind of a nice thing to do and maybe only the big companies or the companies that really had to do it did it. Now everybody needs to do it. We just can't be competitive nowadays without doing reliability. So Fluke Reliability is here to help you uh, as you're on your reliability journey. So 
Um, one last slide that I'm going to cover here uh, before we get into solutions, and that's just to show you that um, this has taken us many years to bring this uh, fluke reliability portfolio together. And so as of today, there are three major subgroups. You'll see that uh, Fluke Connect, Proof Technic, and eMaint are, are the major products and services that we've brought together under this Fluke reliability group. It's important to state that we design all of our products in the best of breed uh, so that, uh, you know, each one one can be purchased independently and will do its job, but in addition, all of our products are designed to operate or will soon operate together under the Excelix um, IoT platform. So uh, Excelix is not a product we sell, but a software technology that's built around our products and brings them to share the data and communication with other systems and with all of the maintenance team members. We want to get the, the right information to the right person to make the right decision and keep the plant up and running. So it's the technical glue that connects the ecosystem and makes it possible to add new tools and solutions in a Lego-like fashion. Because you may already have a couple of the tools and we don't want you to stop using those tools. We want to help you find out what other tools you need and how to piece that all together and use what you already have and, and the new things and bring that all together. So because we believe that connected reliability, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Okay, so now that we're gonna talk about solutions, I'm gonna turn it over to Dries. So Dries, please take over. Hey, uh, thank you, John. And indeed, I think hey, if we look at the, the product portfolio of, of Fluke reliability right now, and, and and in analogy to that um, tiered approach, I really see, uh, you need a tool that is right for the person that is using it, right? If you have an operator, he just wants um, a basic tester and maybe do a quick vibration test uh, with a simple tool. And then you have your, your specialist who needs to be able to get to go really in depth and, and do a full analysis. And that's really the approach that you should take when, when you're looking for the right tools to use as well. I say, okay, who is going to be using this tool day to day? What is the job that it needs to accomplish with that? What is the information that it needs to gather and then figure out what is the best tool for it? And you see here a very in a quick glance um, uh, that that with Fluke reliability we have a, a big portfolio basically suiting that that same tiered level. Say okay, what do we need and how do we um, how do we do it? And basically, uh, with the, the motto should really be uh, that you're trying to get the answers to the to the right people. And if we go um, on the next slide, I'll give you a quick example there. Um, basically, we talk about um, basically we talk about um, the um, getting the answer to the right people. And this is an example here of a uh, of some of our vibration equipment, and where we say, okay, there has been handheld data collectors for many years out in the market, but and the, typically that data would go into a little container, meaning you had a vibration department and they would look at that data and they out of that vibration department, a um, a report would come out with some recommendations. But that's something that, uh, that needs to change right now. That data needs to be accessible. So so an operator, for example, has a live feedback of, of how, how the machines are doing. So if he hears something that sounds off and he can see that, hey, indeed, the vibration also notice that change and that will help him to decide do I call maintenance or do I um, or do I keep running right so um, this is an example here of, of uh, something we call asset view and basically see from your handheld data collector or from the uh, continuous monitoring systems you get a, a dashboard like interface that's understandable for everybody and say okay what is the condition of my asset park and then you can dive in time to the um, to the actual machine level seeing live data but a tool like this is not built for the analyst to do in-depth troubleshooting no it's built for the operator for the for the maintenance manager for the uh, for the plant supervisor to say hey how is what's the condition of my asset park right to make that data um, accessible so that the right people can can make the right draw the right conclusions and take the right actions um, and then another example here i think on the next slide is um, the alignment systems where we do a similar approach we say okay this needs to be um, a connected system right it's not just a person goes that does an alignment and then calls his boss okay the alignment is good no um, 
you need to be able to to document that data to maybe prepare that job and send it back over to um, the system eh? so you're 100 sure that they're going after the right asset with the right um, information and then that information comes back again to um, the software so the the maintenance planner or the more in-depth um, maintenance guys can use that data to draw their um, draw their conclusions and, and track it over time right so connecting these systems is really where the um, where the value is in uh, in this case and these are just two examples of, of some of our products but let's look at the bigger picture now and uh, with the with the Asilix platform and then how that basically creates this connected reliability because that's really where where the value can be added and where the um, where the goal should be. If you look at, we have all our goals, right? Everybody, every department gets our goals lined up saying, hey, you need to increase your asset availability. We need to start doing proactive maintenance because they picked up that buzzword from some trade show. Eh? And oh, by the way, uh, not only do you have to do that, but you also need to save some cost, right? So uh, these are really the goals that, that any maintenance departments these days have, right? Say, okay, we need more uptime and we need to save costs, okay? And then the results and the right hand side there is okay, that should be that uptime, should be less cost and should be um, and increasing productivity and so on and so forth. So there's a couple steps in between there that we need to take to be able to get there. And the first one is, is you need the knowledge, right? You need the right people. Um, you need to um, know where you are today and uh, where, how you can improve your situation to get to um, that end result of, of increasing your reliability. And once you have the, the knowledge in place and you have the right um, people in your team and you know, hey, maybe we need some extra training here or there, then you can start looking at the data that you actually get from your, um, from your systems and, and try to create um, with the asset you have, with the, with the knowledge you have, you can try to create um, better insights into your machines and say, okay, what is actually going on in my machine park, right? Um, and because now you have data coming from your assets, coming from your uh, process information, combined with the knowledge in your team, you can create certain insights and that will then result in, in the right actions to take. And that's really the idea that we're not, not guessing on which actions that need to be taken, but we define using data from our machines um, with the proper knowledge and the proper software tools to create um, the insights that we need and from there on we can conclude which actions to take so that's really the four let's say main components here when we're trying to go from our yearly um, meeting goals our yearly uh, goals for the liability department or maintenance department to the actual um, results if we dive a little bit deeper into that and and how we approach it within the fluke reliability um, world is and we have this um, this ecosystem we call it where where all these pieces um, come back right we see the data on the left hand side we see our actions on the completely right and then in between and we have the knowledge and we have tools to create um, these insights <clears throat> so and the idea is really that <clears throat> you need a um, some kind of interconnected system and that's when we really talk about connected um, reliability because it's it's not one component by itself that's going to make or break it it's really the combination of these different um, tools or these different uh, components that will uh, make your uh, department thrive so diving into them um, one by one a little bit deeper is that a connected data i think speaks for itself a proof tunic as a proof tunic and fluke as a traditional um hardware manufacturing company uh, saying here, okay, we have great tools out there, which I think everybody here is well aware of to, to cover any type of, of data that you might need, uh, vibration, ultrasound, uh, the new sonic imager there, for example, uh, you see there's innovations, there is traditional products that, that we need and uh, that can provide us the right data. So I think on the data side, we're good, right? We can, we know, um, we know data very well and we've spent decades of uh, decades and decades of building the, the best tools out there um, for, to collect that data. But it's not the data by itself, as John was saying, it's it's not the data by itself that's going to solve the problem, right? You need to get that data into one um, into one connected system. And that's what we talk about here on this next slide, saying, okay, um, we get the data coming in now, we need some kind of common denominator where we can 
put all that data together. Uh, typically, a, a data historian, um, uh, like at the Asilix platform, and on top of that, as um, on top of that, connected to that data lake, we have um, tools like the uh, your CMMS systems, and uh, we have the, the e-main software, for example, and other tools for, for example, machine learning, some predictive. Uh, analytics, um, specific analysis and, and reporting tools. So there's different software tools that basically connect to that data and they can really add more data because of, um, they can really add more value because you have different um, tools, right? Different, different sources of data. All the, all the data together is a lot more uh, valuable if you can combine the process data with the vibration data, for example, and you can create a lot more value than just looking at them individually. Of course, there will always be room for uh, some specific uh, tools out there. And if you look at um, a specific vibration software and a CMMS software, uh, and in our connected teams approach, there you'll see that, um, which is something we see on the next slide, is something that um, and you will still need those those specific software, so for example, for the vibration analysis or for your CMMS software, but they all have a specific goal, right? They're connected to that big data source. And then um, you have an, an e-main, for example, to do your work order management and then your, your, um, your warehouse um, scheduling. But then and there's different tools that sit on top of that data and they, they will allow your teams to be connected to that data. So for example, your, your maintenance team out in the field, I can use something like, like a Fluke Mobile to take those work orders in the field with them with historical data as so they can actually draw the right um, conclusions and, and do their job um, more efficiently because they have the information there um, with them. As so we see that there's different specific software tools that run on top of that data to then um, basically connect your teams uh, because every team needs uh, a different approach. And that basically all then comes back to um, connecting that knowledge. So if you have um, the right amount of data, you have the, uh, the tools that your team needs to um, draw the conclusions out of that data and uh, to get insights out of that data. And then the, the team has the right knowledge uh, where you're doing um, training and and with the right trainings, depending on what your team is trying to do, how you can do your, your vibration guys can do a CAT 1 or CAT 2 vibration training. Um, so there's different things that where the knowledge is really, um, uh, it can be added. And then that's really when then the value can be created. And with the, having a team with the right tools, the right data and the right knowledge, that's really what will then bring you, um, excel your, your maintenance strategy. And if we then go on the next slide where you see that all comes then together, right? We have um, our goals on the left-hand side, the different, um, the different pillars of knowledge, data, insights, and actions there. You need the knowledge, the data, and the, um, the data all together with the proper software tools to create the insights. And then from there, we define what the actions are. And that's really how, how we would in Fluke reliability um, see how the connected reliability um, should be and not an individual vibration um, data source that's not connected to anything. No, the value is really in connecting all these different pieces and um, drawing conclusions out of that because you can create much more value out of combining your asset condition data with your process data um, and then um, taking the right actions out of there. So I think that's really where, where everything comes together and where we get, um, we're able to draw the right um, conclusions out of it. And that's what, what we at Fluke Reliability would, would call the true connected reliability uh, because all those different um, pillars are interwoven and are connected in an, in an automated way. So had the right people have access to the right data um, so they can draw the right um, conclusions and, and create the right insights to, to define the, the actions that need to be taken. Okay, I think that was really the, the last part here that I wanted to, um, to cover to say, okay, and we got a great intro from John going through the PNF curve and how we get to define what actions we need to take and what, what data is, is important and how we can best approach that so we don't get lost in, in or overwhelmed with saying, oh, we're gonna do 
hundred percent um, proactive maintenance. No, choose a choose a tiered approach, and then okay, now we know how we're going to approach our assets and how we're going to approach maintenance. Now say okay, what data do we need um, to draw the to good conclusions? How are we going to combine that data with the right knowledge and with the tools to um, to create value out of that data? And then out of that, we can draw our um, actions. So I think that really combines the whole um, the whole presentation here into that connected reliability uh, view where we are talking about. So thank you very much, Dries, for uh, uh, for that, and uh, thanks for uh, um, going through those uh, solutions with us. And let me let me add one one quick thing, if I can, before we uh, turn this over to Leah and finish this up. Um, the way I look at this is think about way over on the left is your point A, and way over on your right is point B. You know, we all know that in the maintenance, uh, you know, and operations world uh, today. You know, we all have these goals and we we all know that we want to be able to get to better reliability, better maintenance, uh, be, uh, improved, uh, you know, operations. But the but the problem is always how do we get from point A to point B? How do we get from where we are to where we want to be? And that's really where Fluke Reliability is there to help you on your path to go from point A to point B because a lot of people uh, have troubles doing that. So that's what we're here to do is to try to help you on that path. But great, great job, Dries. Thanks a lot. Perfect, yes, All thank right. you for adding that. Yeah. Do you guys want to ask one final question of the audience? Yes, let me see if I can get my uh, computer to work. There we go. So Leah, one, one last poll question, go right ahead. Okay, and the reason we want to ask this one is we've just put a whole lot of ideas toward you all. Take a minute and read this. So we're we're wondering, now that we've given you sort of this big, wonderful picture of tiering your maintenance and your team and your data collection and your systems, how far along on this journey are you? Indeed, some of the folks who've written in questions are like, is anyone doing this well? So we wanted to ask you guys, are you integrating your asset data and using it for analytics? Or are you working on it in a pilot program, trying to sync your data and systems? Or are you researching and thinking about it? Or it's on your list and you know you need to organize your data a little bit better? Or it's just not on your radar? And I appreciate you answering this because a lot of the questions that have come in are sort of similar to this. John and Dries gave you sort of the build up um, from looking at what you have to what you want to do. All right, I'm gonna close it down. I know there's a lot to read there. Got some great response, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna share the results. We've got some folks who indeed have integrated their asset data with their systems and are using it. And a good number of folks who are either actively in a pilot or who are researching and planning one, good for you. And then a good number of folks who are organizing their data. That's a great first step is organizing your data. And then people who aren't quite ready yet. All right. John Andres, do you wanna have a quick, quick mention yeah, of your you thoughts kinda, on that? You kinda see indeed, um, <clears throat> how we went from, if we would do the same questions, uh, we did the three poll questions mm -hmm. five years ago, you would see um, a completely different answer. I think you would see probably think so. vibration and then the other technologies on, on the smaller side, but then we came to realize, okay, we really need to have different sources of data. And I think we'll see mm -hmm. something similar here that that this whole connected reliability ID is, is, is rather new and using some of these analytics, which we hear on, on the television and, and wherever else, um, really, I think, slowly are, are coming into the market with, with solutions that are easy to use and that are yep. um, that can it create value fairly quickly. Yes, exactly. So yeah. I think we'll see this. This is kind of the same what we see in the market, and, and thanks, everybody, for answering indeed. Um, but we'll see this progress as well, and that's why companies like Fluke Reliability really try to focus on okay, this this bigger picture connected reliability and then providing all the different um, steps in between as well as right. knowledge to, to support the customer. <laughs> you have to right? break it down. Mm -hmm. 
All right, I'm going to hide these results and then, um, oh, it's going to be, it's going to do that thing again. All right. Okay. Um, it's just that kind of day. John, if you will forward to the question slide. I will. As because long as I want to make sure. There yep, we go. you're on. I want to make sure that people have your emails for both of you. So if you have questions, you all are welcome to email John and Dries directly. I'm going to answer, ask a couple of your questions now. And then uh, any questions we haven't answered, we'll get back to you in writing. And we'll post a Q&A. All right. So could you, either John or Dries, um, give us the quick advice on how you define critical equipment. Is there a standard that you use to decide which, which equipment needs the highest level of attention? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'll, I'll take a first stab at it and then Dries, maybe you uh, can add to it if you want. Um, there is no real magic formula um, and uh, we, we do have some, uh, some ideas where you know, instead of, you know, trying to say, you know, um, what is what is the formula to pick that? Um, and, and there are some criticality analysis surveys that uh, we can help customers with, but it but it really boils down to, you know, think of it like this, you know, what is what is your star athlete? What is the one or two machines that if it goes down, if you think it just like an NFL star or something, that 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 athlete has a their own doctor, their own specialist, their own everything, you know. So there there may be one or two machines in your plant that already has an expert following it. And then and then you move down to your really critical machines that if those machines go down, then your plant is going to have a huge reduction in in uh, in downtime. And then you move down to your less critical that are still going to be a nightmare to the maintenance team, but maybe not shut down the plant, you know, so it's going to knock down your capability, but not not really kill you. And then you get down to the bottom where you've got machines that uh, just don't make an impact. So so we have some ideas and it really depends on your plant. When you sit down and do a criticality list, it's really nothing more than making a list of all your machines and then setting some parameters, you know, some questions about, you know, um, what is critical about this machine? Is it the repair cost? Is it the downtime? Um, is it that I've got to uh, uh, bring in some specialist, long time to order parts, an environmental impact? And so really it depends on the asset, it depends on your company, it depends on um, the application. There are a lot of variables. So um, I, I couldn't give you, a, there's no magic formula, but there are some things we can do to help you kind of work on that. Dries, any ideas? I think that uh, is a pretty good description of um, uh, of what what you should do and, and how to best approach it, right? Hopefully, I think we can. Um, so I think that answers the question. I hope so. Maybe we I can so. uh, squeeze in a couple other questions yep. here. Yep. I as a follow-on question, somebody else asked. Uh, how you decide what kind of predictive tools or inspections to use or what points of inspection to use on which pieces of equipment? So I'll, uh, I'll have a go at that. So go basically you would look at, uh, at your asset and basically define the failure modes, right? So if mm -hmm. you know what can potentially go wrong with this machine, mm -hmm. then you can go in the market or, or find the specialist and say, okay, how can I potentially measure that specific failure mode and, and try to predict it. And um, so mm -hmm. once you do a, a failure mode analysis of your specific machine, then you will also be able to define the technologies that suit those failure modes to be able to detect them. And luckily there's a lot of experience out there in the, and you're not the only one with some exotic screw compressor or something, that machine is built somewhere else as well, right? So so like like us with, with Proof Tunic and with Fluke now, um, we see a lot of these machines and a lot of different customers. So we kind of already know what to uh, what to expect for most of them and, and can be a pretty good job in, in advising the, um, the failure modes and then the technologies to, um, to yeah. find those and predict those. Yeah. How long does it take to get started, do you think? Um, like, like I showed earlier, um, 
Getting started, it, it's hard to say. It depends on the number of machines, the number of assets, the number of resources. The one thing I can say, though, is, um, well, two things. Number one, um, don't start too big. You know, so if you've got 3,000 assets, um, the biggest thing you could do wrong is, is you know, try to say, okay, we're going to start them all up now. Um, you know, and the other thing to think about is that, you know, so start with pilot programs, get things, get things started, get things moving. The other thing is reliability is not a destination, it's a journey. So keep in mind that getting a program up and going is really a never ending thing, you know? <laughs> so Indeed. I have seen over the years that I've been in reliability, 20 or 30 years now, um, I have seen the case where a customer gets a program up and started uh, in a year. They uh, they get it fine tuned. They get it working really good in two years. At their third year, the thing is just a, a, a smooth running machine, and they're just they're, they 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 uh, they they don't have many downtimes and everything's good. And then the new CEO comes in and says, "How come this reliability program is costing us so much money, and I can't see?" Uh, you know, what What are they saving us? So what I'm saying is don't ever let your guard down. Don't ever stop <laughs> documenting saves because as right. soon as you stop documenting saves, a new CEO is going to cancel your liability program. And guess what? In a year or so, you're going to be right in the same mess you were before. Well, on that cheery note, I'm going to have you forward to the last couple of slides, please. Okay. There we go. So when I close this webinar down, folks, you're going to see that survey. Please do answer it. It gives us great feedback for what kind of other uh, topics you'd like us to present on. And you'll be able to go to the excelx.com page for a recording of this one. We'll also uh, send you these slides if you if you do answer the survey. So I want to take a minute and thank both John and Dries for being with us today. You guys did an awesome job. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. It was a pleasure to be here. Okay. Thank you for hosting, Alia. Yeah, I look forward to having everyone here with us next time. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.